Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. One scripture said, let the high praises of God be in your mouth. That's right. That means you add a little volume to it and you let a hallelujah roll. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Blessed be the mighty name of the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, I think through the years I probably have preached some things people haven't heard before. I preached a few things I had never heard before. <laughs> Said things I never heard anybody else say or myself until I said them. Sometimes I say, somebody get me that CD or something so I can see what I said. Hey Amen. This preaching business is something else. What a good looking crowd on Sunday night. Hey Amen. Full house. People love the Lord. Hungry for the things of God. Want more of it. Blessed are they with hunger and thirst after righteousness for they shall be filled. And it's been an honor to be with you these two weeks, be uh, enjoying the presence of the Lord that you've cultivated here and the great revival of this church. This is a revival church. It's a growing church. It's a spiritual church. And I thank God for you and your contribution to the kingdom. Keep it up. And, uh, of course, I've known Pastor Blankenship for a long time, for many, many years now. But uh, just getting a chance to stay in the house and talk and ride in the car and have a little fellowship time reminds me one more time. And you, you may know this, but it's very important to recognize that, that Pastor Blankenship is a man of great faith. Uh, no matter what problems may be handling or dealing with, you peel the layers back, he's trusting God. He's believing there's going to be a miracle there somewhere, that somewhere God is going to answer. It is, a, it is a tremendous demonstration of faith that he has and hope that when you peel everything else away, we're just trusting the Lord's going to get it done. And look what the Lord has done. Amen. Uh, the book of Psalm, chapter number 37, is where we'll be going for the word tonight. What dynamic music ministry you have in this church. And uh, I encourage you to keep worshiping the way you do. Keep the atmosphere lively. Keep it prayerful. The undergirding of prayer of this church is very powerful. The altar services are, you know, every time after the ministry of the word, the altar service is a prayer meeting. Really, Pentecost is a prayer meeting at its core. <laughs> Everything comes out of the prayer, but... The altar service especially is a prayer meeting. So when you come to the altar and pray after we've heard the word of the Lord, it's very important that you really put your heart into it and that you touch God in prayer before you leave. It makes it all stick. Psalm chapter 37. Now i got to hurry because i got a flight to catch. It's almost that bad. My flight leaves at 5.30 a.m., that's when the flight leaves. So pastor's got to get up at 4 o'clock in the morning and take me over to the airport. And I like doing that just to let these pastors know how us road warriors are out here sacrificing for doing the work. Come on, pastor. This is what we do. Amen. Of course, that's right, Uber. Of course, he'll be back at home, back in bed and sleeping by the time I get through security, probably. Psalm 37, 23, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. And the Lord delighteth in his way. Though he fall, he shall not be utterly cast down, for the Lord upholdeth him with his hand. I have been young and now I'm older, yet I have not seen the righteous forsaken, nor his seed. His family, children, grandchildren, begging bread. I want to talk to you about order in the court of life here tonight. I believe God's doing something with all of us, through all of us. I appreciated the song our sister just sang. Amen. Right in the same vein. Would you pray with me before we go directly to the word? Lord, across this auditorium tonight, I feel the brush of angels' wings. 
We've been to a high place of worship. We've been in the deep place of meditation. We are now, Lord, in the in-between, and we pray, Lord, that you will minister to us deeply. Let this word fall like seed into the soil of our ready hearts. Let it, Lord, be not just for the moment a temporary idea, but let it be planted as an eternal seed, incorruptible. Let it work for us through the rest of this week, month, and years to come. We'll give you the praise and the glory. Would you clap your hands to the Lord for his goodness? Because the Lord is good. The Lord is good. Somebody ought to know that. If you do, testify with your hand praise. The Lord is good. His mercy is everlasting. His truth endureth to all generations. Woo! And God bless you. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. Cinderella had fallen upon hard times. <laughs> Sermons have to start somewhere, my brother. This is where we're starting tonight. Everyone else was going to the ball, and she was left at home, all alone, to do all the work by herself. Her particular state of affairs was unfair. Sad, gloomy, and dismal. Then appears fairy godmother. Cinderella's off to the ball. Horse-drawn carriage, new dress, new hairdo, and of course, new shoes. All courtesy of fairy godmother. The fairy godmother was thoughtful enough to arrange for the shoes, at least one of them, to be just slightly too big. So, when Cinderella begins her mad rush away from the ball close to the midnight hour, one shoe would be left behind. It would fall in just the right place so that Prince Charming, when he began his search for her, would discover the shoe and ultimately find Cinderella. The unique arrangement of all of these events falling into place just precisely as they did results in Cinderella's marriage to the prince and she lives happily ever after. It's a fairy tale. Some of you know that better than others. It's a fairy tale, an enchanting tale that has lived a long and fruitful life because it embodies a sense of hope for the unfortunate circumstances in life. See, you and I have an appreciation for the fact that it, there are times it would be nice to just get a little help from another world some unexpected blessing that would show up and interrupt my bleak circumstances and send me off to the ball. Back when Ed McMahon was delivering large checks from Publishers Clearinghouse, he never could seem to find my place. So I rise to say to you tonight, you can wait around on Fairy Godmother if you want to, you can carry a rabbit's foot on your keychain. Wasn't too lucky for the rabbit. You can have a four-leaf clover in one pocket, carry a lucky penny in the other pocket, memorize and play your lucky numbers, wish upon a falling star, but I present to you tonight a far better hope with a much more reasonable expectation, a walk of faith and a trust in God, a God that loves you enough to help you. I remind you, my brothers and sisters, tonight that the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. 
We are not living on just hopeful, random acts. We're not hoping the stars just all align in our direction. But we, like David, are casting ourselves upon the tender mercies and the eternal graces of the Lord that loved us enough to come to earth and die for us. I'm not depending on luck. I'm not hoping to just luck my way through life, hoping some fortune will just fall my way, but I am trusting in the Lord with all my heart. Lean not unto your own understanding, but trust in him with all your ways, and he will direct your paths. I'm here to remind you one more time that the steps of a good man have been prearranged. They've been prepared. They've been planned out. They're controlled, thought, and structured by the Lord. I belong to him and so do you. Once you've been to the water and you've been baptized, once you've been filled with his spirit, you belong to him. He becomes the author and the finisher of your faith. Nobody's in circumstances out of control tonight. He's got the whole world in his hand. He can make a way where there is no way. He can put a door where there is no door. He can put a light in the middle of darkness. He can put a stream in the middle of a desert. I've got to preach to somebody tonight and tell you, you're not helpless. You're not hopeless. It's not impossible. It's not out of control. You serve an almighty God. If I were to ask you tonight, how many believes in God? How many believes there is a God? You believe there's a God in heaven? Then I ask you, why do we behave so many times as though there were no God? Why do we worry as though there were no God? As though there's no God to hear my prayer. No God to feel my pain. No God to see my worship. No God to hear me when I call. You and I know better than that. We know he's as close as the mention of his name. So I implore you tonight, wherever you are, whatever you're dealing with, whatever mountains in your way, whatever devil's attacking you or your family, whatever darkness has rolled in over your life, call that name of Jesus. Uh, you'll find out, uh, amen, that life uh, is under his divine control. He can, he can work it out. I said he can work it out. I'm here to tell you tonight that the mighty God of heaven is stretching forth his hand to work it out. He's going to be your counselor. He's going to be your advocate. He's going to be your lawyer. He's going to be your help. He's going to be the one to give you mercy. He's going to be the one to give you grace. He's going to be the one that loves you when nobody else does. I got to tell somebody tonight, it's not too far gone. You're not too far out. Nobody's too backslid. Nobody's made too big of a mistake. Nobody's gone too far. Nobody's gone out too far that the love of God can't reach you. You've not done too much. Oh, I wish somebody would hear me here tonight. The blood still flows. The anointing still destroys yokes. Amen. The Lord still breaks the chains of darkness. You can be delivered from any addiction. You can be set free from any emotion. You don't have to be consumed by hate. You don't have to be consumed by fear. You don't have to be consumed by jealousy. You don't have to live a life of depression and anxiety. You can be free, and he whom the Son has set free is free indeed. And I'd like for some people that have been set free to clap your hands and shout with the voice of triumph. Shout unto God with the voice of triumph. I once was lost, but not anymore. I once was blind, but not anymore. I once was bound, but not anymore. He found us, delivered us, saved us, and rescued us. So I've come tonight to prophesy. I've come to prophesy to this church. I've come to prophesy into your lives. Prophesy into your world. It's a word of prophetic encouragement. I've come to speak directly that God is arranging the events of your life right now. It matters not whether you see it, whether you know it, whether you're aware of it, or whether you understand it. 
I'm here telling you God is arranging the events and the circumstances of your life. I prophesy to this church and to you, your destiny is not in jeopardy. Your future is not in crisis. I've come to tell you by the word of the Lord I read and by the anointing of the Spirit here tonight that your steps are being divinely orchestrated, ordered by the Lord. Oh, I feel the prophetic unction in the house. I'm here to prophesy to this church tonight. God is about to open a door that no man can shut. Because man's not in charge of it. God is the author and the finisher of our faith. Oh, mankind can affect it. Mankind can get in the way of it. Mankind can sometimes delay it. But I've come to tell you the spirit is speaking strong tonight. God's opening a door that man cannot shut. God's about to make a way through the wilderness. I don't know who I'm preaching to tonight that you've got it in your mind. It's impossible. It's impossible. I've come to tell you nothing is impossible with God. I've come to tell you he'll make a way through your wilderness. I'm going to prophesy into your spirit until the seed sticks to you and begins to grow. Until the light shines in your darkness. I've come to tell you he's making a way. He'll carve it out. He'll make a way right through the Red Sea if he has to part the waters and let you walk across on dry ground. He'll make a way. I've come to prophesy to this house tonight. God's going to shut the lion's mouth. The lion may be roaring. The devil may be barking in your ear. He may be lying to you. That's all he does, by the way. Just lie, 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 lie all the time. Lies like a rug. But I'm here to tell you tonight, the Lord is, you know, one, one old song we used to sing said, let God arise. Comes from a scripture. Let God arise and his enemies be scattered. I come to tell you in the Holy Ghost tonight, I feel God getting up. I feel him standing up. And he's saying, I'm shutting the lion's mouth. I feel God standing up and saying, the fire is not going to consume you. Your circumstance is not going to destroy you. You know, there does come a time that God just stands up and says, all right, that's it. You've been faithful. You've trusted. You've held on. He, I'm not going to suffer you to be tempted above that which you're able to bear. And I feel the Lord rising up tonight and saying, no weapon that is formed against you is going to prosper. I feel the Lord saying, I'll shake the foundation of the prison. I'll break the chains of bondage. I am here to make a way. I feel deliverance in the house. I feel victory in the house. I feel the anointing that destroys yokes in the house. God said, enough's enough. I'm here to fix this thing. Woo! I feel a prophetic word from the Lord. The long drought is about to end. I went to Singapore several years ago, took my son with me. We got over to Singapore right when they were having a drought. It had been 60-something days since it had rained. It was the longest period of rain for that island, uh, time without rain, that they had had in like 140 years or something. It was very significant. Singapore is a very beautiful city, very modern, very sophisticated. It, uh, there's beautiful gardening. They, a number of years ago, they did a beautification, planted trees and shrubbery and stuff and flowers all over the city in between the roads and around all the buildings. There are a lot of water fountains and and a lot of waterfalls and flowing water all over the city. It's a beautiful, gorgeous city. But it was eerie that all the fountains were off and all the waterfalls were off. And they were in a very serious drought. My son and I were there and met with Pastor Bobby Matthews and went and got something to eat. And at lunch he was telling me about all of this. Something came over me. Sometimes I kind of read myself into them Old Testament and New Testament characters and he is telling me about all this, and I got to feeling like Elijah. <laughs> I leaned across that table, and I said, Pastor, I'm prophesying to you right now. It's going to rain before I leave here. That was on a Friday. I was leaving Sunday night, 
Sunday morning was the last service leaving Sunday night and the midnight train to Georgia. Well, actually to Florida, but nevertheless. Well, I, I didn't really think all that through. <laughs> I just said it <laughs> under the unction of the Lord. And, uh, of course, it didn't rain on Friday, and by this time he had done told everybody. I was full of faith. But come Saturday, I was starting to waver a little. I was afraid, oh God, let it rain. You know, sometimes you got to pray your prophecies come to pass. Nothing on Saturday. Sunday morning, we're on our way to church, and pastor doesn't drive so we come over in a uh, I think it was a taxi or Uber one of them kind of things to pick us up and take us over to the church we're on our way riding together and all of a sudden I see water droplets all over the windshield I said "Woo! look at there my son Zach he's a brainiac you know got master's degrees and all this stuff my youngest son calls him Zachopedia I said look at there water on the windshield my son Zach said dad the car in front of us is washing their windshield. It's blowing. I said, will you have a little faith? It's a sign. Don't you know a sign when you see a sign? It's a sign from God. <laughs> you know, when you're reaching and stretching, you know, you can make anything work. I'm preaching that Sunday there. In, we're on a third floor office complex and it's an office building and pretty good sized place and I'm preaching I'm going along and suddenly back there in the left hand corner I see a commotion people were over they got these giant curtains covering up the windows and they're over there and looking around and pulling back and this is just my nature if you intend on messing up while I'm preaching I said hey what are y'all doing back there <laughs> what, what are you doing back there what in the world's going on and one of them said pulled that big curtain back when he pulled that big curtain back it was a downpour I mean it was pouring that church went into a shout I didn't finish preaching we just had an altar call I said whoo look what the Lord has done well I just come to tell you Norfolk tonight I feel that same kind of spirit I hear the sound of abundance of rain you got to hear me tonight I don't just hear rain. I hear abundance. I'm prophesying abundance over you. I'm telling you uh, that the drought is over. The dry spell is ended. Uh, the dry time has come to an end. Uh, the clouds are forming. Uh, I see the rain. Uh, I hear the rain. Uh, and I hear the sound of abundance. Uh, I'm not talking about a few water droplets. Uh, I'm talking about the latter rain uh, and the former rain uh, coming together uh, in the first month. Uh, I'm prophesying to this church tonight. Uh, I hear the sound of abundance. Uh, I feel abundance. I see abundance. I hear abundance. I see it in worship. I see it in prayer. I see it in the harvest of souls. I see it in financial blessing. Some of you need to get ready. You've been sowing faithfully. You've been giving your tithes. You've been giving your offering. You've been sowing into missions. I've come to tell you the clouds are well seated in Norfolk Apostolic Church. And I hear the sound of abundance tonight you need to get ready to be blessed you need to wrap your brain around God's going to bless me God's going to help me God's going to prosper me somebody shout yes pastor and I were talking today we're reminded of a story from my mentor brother Billy Cole there was a man in the church you sow into it brother God's going to bless it about a man in the church came to Brother Cole and said, Brother Cole, I got a little problem. Tell me about it, brother. He said, well, you know, I've always given my tithes, and giving my tithes wasn't that difficult when I was just making a little bit of money. He said, but now look how the Lord has blessed me, and I got all this money coming in. He said, I have to be honest with you. It's getting a little bit harder to write them big checks and pay all them big tithes. Brother Cole said, I'll pray for you. Reached his hand over there and said, dear God, I ask you to reduce this man's blessing back to where he is comfortable. That man said, oh, Brother Cole, I said, no, no, I'll be okay. 
<laughs> Hallelujah. I don't want God to reduce me back to where I'm comfortable. I want God not just to up my standard of living, but up my standard of giving. I'm ready for God to bless me. I'm ready to be expanded. I'm ready to get into the overflow. Somebody shout yes. I know I need to move on, get to my point here tonight, but I just feel this abundance thing is sticking right here. It needs to stick to somebody. Abundance. You know what abundance is? Abundance is just a little more than you need. Now, we know God will supply all our needs according to his riches and glory, but when he supplies more than you need, it goes into abundance. That's the overflow, and I feel overflow in this faithful house. The one thing from a prophetic vantage point that I feel among you is I feel faithfulness. I feel years of diligent faithfulness. I discern years of faithful disciplined living and I'm telling you God's going to bless it you have built a foundation that can support a pretty high building here and God's getting ready to flow with an abundance on your family you know for God to bless the church he's got to bless you it don't come falling out of the sky here somewhere out of these air conditioned vents into the bank account of the church it comes through your hands that means you're blessed that means God's multiplying you that means God's help am I Am I prophesying to anybody tonight that's been holding on, trusting the Lord? It looks impossible. It feels like there's no way. It feels like it can't happen. I know what I'm preaching about tonight. My wife and I, we're trying to buy a house and we're late in life to be trying to do something like that. Amen. And uh, the house we're living in, it's for sale right now. The landlady's selling it. Fortunately, she's got a price too high. And nobody's even looked at it yet. But our boxes are packed. We've got boxes over in a storage facility in Florida. Our furniture's wrapped up in blankets and saran wrap. When I get home tomorrow, most of our stuff's wrapped up. We just kind of make and do on what we have. But we don't, we don't have the money we need for the down payment. We don't have a place where we're living. We don't know where to go. We don't know what city we're moving to. Now we're boxed. We're packed because we know we're moving. We just don't know where. We just don't know when. We just don't know what under what circumstances. But I'm telling you tonight from the voice of experience that God is ordering steps. It's going to come right on time. He's never too early and he's never too late. He's not only Jehovah Jireh. He's Jehovah Nicotine. Yeah, I made that one up, Brother Bimbry. Jehovah Nicotine. He's an on-time God. Yes, he is. He may not come when you want him to, but he'll be there right on time. I'm preaching to you about an on-time God here tonight. He's not going to fail you. He's not going to forget you. He's not going to abandon you. Well, I don't know what's going to happen to my little sermon. I'm so far out of the note, but I'm just going to... I, I, I think I'm on the right topic. <laughs> Years ago, we was, talking, we was talking about testimony service back in the uh, uh, office tonight. And how dangerous it used to be back when we had testimony service. You know what, is anybody have anything they want to say? What were we thinking? Dangerous times. I lived through those dangerous times. I could tell some stories. And, uh, but when my wife and I were just married and uh, rented us a little place on third floor, and out of nowhere, the landlord like almost tripled our rent and we couldn't afford it and so we desperately started looking for a place to go and couldn't find any place and didn't have first month last month and all the months they need you know back in those days I was so poor I couldn't afford to pay attention <laughs> and we were struggling the days were ticking by we got the notice the second notice the third notice and then we got the one that said we were going to be the sheriff was coming on Friday to set us out. Now, if you ain't never been set out, you missed out on a great experience in life. <laughs> the reason they call it setting out is because they come and they take all your stuff out of your apartment and they set it out on the curb. And then it's up to you to figure out what you're going to do with it. 
Now, I know all you rich folks never, got, never did anything like this, but back in the day where I come from, all of us got set out from time to time. And so they were coming on Friday. Well, in those days, we had church on Thursday night Bible study. My wife and I went to church Thursday night, knew they were coming the next day to set us out. That's a kind of a tough little Bible study to keep your mind on what they're talking about there. I was sitting there, and there's an old country boy from down in Mississippi moved up to Frederick, Maryland. He was sitting beside me, John, John Fur. We're sitting in church Bible study, and he looked over at me, looked back, looked over at me again. You know, then my eyes kind of slanted over like that. I said, what? He said, what? He said, what? Cool. He said, what's going on with you? I said, nothing. He said, don't tell me nothing. I can see it all over you. He said, I'm going to talk to you after church. I said, all right. Well, you know, after church, he got to talking to me. I said, well, we're getting set out tomorrow. I was sitting there in that service, and I was thinking, next time we have testimony service, and all the people get up and say, the Lord's never failed me. I'm going to have to be the only person with a testimony that says, you know, the Lord's only ever failed me once. <laughs> uh, this one time, he failed me. The other time, every other time he's come through, but he only ever. That's, that's going to be my testimony. Everybody else, the Lord never failed me. My testimony is going to be, the Lord only ever failed me once. So I'm talking to, talking to John after church, and he says, well, don't, let's don't let him set you out. He said, uh, you got a truck, I've got a truck, and we'll just go get all your stuff. So all my stuff fit in his truck. And we had mattresses on the left and right and all the stuff in between and big ropes over the top. And uh, there we went. Looked like Beverly Hillbillies. <laughs> he said, you can come stay at our house tonight. I said, all right. So we get to his house. And this is just the way we roll back in the day. When we roll into his house, he says, now, wait here while I go ask my landlord if it's all right. <laughs> See? We, we packed up and on the way to the house, and he's going to ask the landlord once we get there. So we're sitting out in the driveway waiting on the verdict. He comes out bouncing and smiling. He said, landlord says it's going to be all right. I said, well, thank you very much. He said, not only that, he said, tomorrow, if you're interested, just about a block from here down the street, he's been working on a little apartment, and he hasn't even put it in the newspaper or anything yet because he just got it done. He said, if you're interested, maybe you take a look at it. We go down there the next day. We like it. He said, if you want it, just move your stuff in. Didn't require no first month, last month, all them months. We moved in. Once we got moved in, my wife came to me crying. She got out a paper. And she said, I learned this from Sister Cole. Sister Cole had told her a story about one time they had a great need. And she wrote a letter to Jesus. And in the letter to Jesus, she wrote the things that they needed. She, got, she said, I, I wrote this letter to Jesus. And she said, she put down about three or four things that she was asking God, will we get another apartment that maybe could be in there? And every single one of them in her letter was in that apartment. We'd have never found it. It wasn't even advertised. But when we were over unloading our stuff, we thought we were avoiding the sheriff. But God was ordering our steps. The night we stayed overnight, we never took it off the truck until we moved it into the place where God had it. We lived there for several years. It was quite a blessing. I don't know who I'm preaching to tonight, but your testimony is not going to be the Lord only ever failed me once. I stand here 37 years later to tell you the Lord has never failed us. He's never let us down. Somebody shout yes. yes. See, a courtroom is a place where conflicts of life are deliberated. In a courtroom, the law is greater than the people. Lady Justice is supposed to be wearing a blindfold. It's in the courtroom that arguments are presented. Evidence is examined. Testimonies are given and then cross-examined for authenticity. It's in the courtroom of life that the weak and the vulnerable can find representation to argue their cause. Sometimes, though, in the heat of the debate, in the face of controversial evidence, contradicting witnesses, the courtroom can erupt into confusion and into chaos. Someone becomes overcome with emotion. 
They burst out. Someone responds. Now it becomes a shouting match. And they're yelling across the room. Decorum is lost. Too many voices all at once to hear what's happening. Opposing views all being shouted loudly at the same time. It is in the midst of this confusion. It is in the midst of this chaos that the judge picks up the gavel. Brings it down and says, order in the court. And when the judge says order in the court, that means it's time for all this to stop. Things are coming into alignment. The process is going to prevail. Well, I've come to tell you tonight under a prophetic anointing that the righteous judge of all judges is tonight speaking into your chaos. He has raised up the gavel in the midst of your confusion. His voice is greater than all the other voices. And I hear him saying, order in the court by the authority that is on me as a man of God. With apostolic anointing tonight, I declare God is bringing the situation into divine order. I declare the accuser's voice must be silent. The prosecution must take its seat. The judge has spoken. There will be order in this court. I've come to declare it. You're going to see a new week. You're going to see a new month. Things are about to change. God's in control. The eternal God is your refuge. And underneath are his everlasting arms. You know what that means? Sometimes things get so bad. We say, how's it going? say, well, I've hit rock bottom. I've hit rock bottom. Well, let me talk to you about rock bottom. Because there's really no such thing as rock bottom in a way. Because the Bible said underneath are the everlasting arms. Underneath what? Underneath everything. Underneath whatever. Underneath whatever's happening. Underneath whatever's going on. Way down there. When you ever get down to the bottom, just look a little lower. When you're as low as you've ever been, just look down a little deeper. You'll find out underneath your deepest sorrow, underneath your lowest point, are the everlasting arms of God. So if there is such a thing as rock bottom, it's Jesus because he's the rock. Amen. He's the rock of ages. If you ever hit rock bottom, you're going to find yourself cradled in the everlasting arms of God. I wish somebody would shout hallelujah tonight. My mother used to sing a song. The answer's on the way, this I know. Jesus said it, I believe it, and it's so. Our Heavenly Father knows our needs before we pray. And you can rest assured, the answer's on the way. I'm prophesying, so I don't know, you might just want to, you know why people raise their hand when a preacher's preaching? Because they want to catch what's going by. They're volunteering for that to come to pass in their life. When I tell you the answer's on the way, somebody said, Phew. I volunteer for that. I catch that. I want that. Some people aren't happy to raise their hand. They got to jump up. They're trying to get an edge on you. They're trying to get it before it gets back there to where you're sitting. Hallelujah. Hey, there's enough to go around here tonight. I'm telling you, God can make a way. God orders steps. Moses, Moses asked the Lord, show me thy glory. And the Lord put him in the cleft of the rock and covered him up with his hand. Now he couldn't see nothing. Isn't that just the way the Lord is sometimes? We're asking the Lord to give us a vision. The Lord puts him in the rock, covers him up. He can't see nothing at all. At least I could see a little bit before this. And the Lord's got him covered up. And then after a little while, the Bible said, the Lord removed his hand. And he saw what the Bible called the hinder parts of God. Many theologians believe that what Moses saw was he saw eternity past he saw prophecy in the past and he saw the creation story he saw in the beginning God created heaven and earth and the earth was out form and void and darkness upon the face of the deep you know it was Moses that wrote that down for us they say that's when God showed him what all happened he saw the past glories of God in other words God said I'm a, you want to see my glory let me move my hand and show you what all I've done already. 
I know you can't see it. You're all covered up with life. But you know, just because you don't see something doesn't mean it isn't there. How many times you walked out in front of somebody in Walmart and they almost ran you over with their cart? Pulled out in front of somebody at a stop sign. I did it going to the airport, coming here. I pulled out at a light. And when I pulled out, this car was in the other lane, but he was moving into that lane just as I pulled out, horn blowing and all that stuff. I'm like, my bad, I'm sorry, my bad. I didn't see him, but he didn't disappear. I wish I'd help you understand there are things you don't see, but they're just as real and they're there. And here in a minute, I'm prophesying to you tonight. God's gonna move his hand and say, let me show you what I've been working on. And then you're gonna sing. When I think of the goodness of Jesus and all that he's done for me, I didn't even know he was working on it. But God works on the night shift. God works in the invisible realm. God works when you don't even know he's working. You got to get beyond your emotion. Get beyond your intellect. I know you don't see it. I know you don't feel it. I know you don't know it. I know you don't understand it. That's why I'm prophesying it. See, sometimes a prophet is like a C&I dog for the spiritually blind. You don't know where to go, so let me lead you. I'm telling you, God's been working on it. God's been hearing your prayer and your faithfulness and seeing you. And he's got it all worked out. And he's getting ready to open your eyes. He's gonna, you're going to say, look what the Lord has done. <laughs> look what the Lord has done. A number of years ago, Pastor... Uh, Willoughby at the time, passed on to be with the Lord now, called me up said, Clindens, I'm just crazy enough to call and ask you this, and I think you're just crazy enough to do it. I said, dear Lord, what do you want me to do? He said, he said, our number one service of the year is December the 23rd. I want you to come preach that service. Well, you know, I understand a little bit about travel, and I knew right away that mean I wasn't getting home for Christmas. I said, what? He said, yeah. I said, well, here's the deal. I'll come, but I got to bring my whole family with me because you just don't be apart from your family at Christmas. Just can't be doing that. So I had a wife and two sons. He said, all right. He said, I'll pay for one of your tickets. We have another pastor here pay for another ticket, and you'll have to raise up the money for two of the tickets. And then we're going to go and be there for Christmas and stay, so it's going to take a lot of money. And I worked it all out about how much all this is going to cost over about twelve, fourteen thousand dollars $14,000, started raising money, saving money, getting money, and it was getting real close. And I was still about $4,000 short. And I was preaching at a church in Shreveport, Louisiana. That Sunday morning, pastor had already given me an offering. He had given me offering several times for different mission trips. He had already given offering to this trip. So I wasn't there trying to raise any money, wasn't asking for any money. They had already given. It was already done. So I... Stepped in the pulpit that morning, was getting ready to read the text. I think I even read the text. I said, hey, folks, just before I go into this, little need that we have, I want to ask this church to pray for me because you've always been kind and generous to us. The pastor's already given. said, but I'm needing about $4,000 to make this trip to Singapore, and I want you to pray the Lord to provide that. I went on into my sermon. had nothing to do with blessing or money or giving or seed sowing or harvesting or sow it, and God grows it and plant the seed. He meets the need or none of that stuff. Just preach my message. I'm out at the table after service. I'm selling CDs in those days, DVDs of Gifts of the Spirit. I had two DVDs, sold them for $40. Lady walks up to the table. She says, I'd like, I'd like, I said, how much are they? I said, they're $40. She said, I'll take two. I said, all right, slid two over. She's talking a mile a minute, and I see her writing the check. It's got four zero zero zero. and I'm thinking, oh, dear Lord. She got two, so $40 or $40 each. Shows me $80. She's writing this out for $40. And I'm trying to be kind. And I'm waiting on a moment to get my, you know, get a word in edgewise. She never did really stop talking, 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 talking. Pulls the check off and hands it to me. As she's handing it to me, I'm starting my speech. I said, sis, I don't think you made this out for the right amount. <laughs> she said, I know. I wanted to bless you. That check wasn't for $40. It was for $4,000. She said this. This is the part that gets me. She said, on the way to church today, and she is a visitor there at that church, she said, I told the Lord, whatever 
need the preacher mentions. Whatever amount he says, I'm going to write the check. And so you said you needed 4000 so here it is. Now, now, here's what I want you to get. I had a need. I wasn't even going to ask for it. I felt like pastor had already contributed. What I didn't know was when I was getting up going to church that morning, my answer was already on the way. I didn't know as I was walking to the pulpit, I was getting ready to make a connection with a provision that I didn't even know existed. It was a side thought. It was an afterthought. It was just an on the way thought. By the way, would y'all pray for me? Because this is my need. I had no idea that I had just made connection with God's plan of provision. Can I tell you, you may not see it till you bump right into it. You may not see it coming. You may not know it's happening. There was absolutely zero evidence until she put the check in my hand. But I'm telling somebody tonight, God is putting pieces together that you don't even know are happening. Woo, go ahead and give the Lord a great big hand praise. I know I need to quit. Hey, la, 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 bossata. Let our musicians come and start getting in place here tonight. I had a trip, had a trip planned a number of years ago to Papua New Guinea. And we had the, uh, we had the ticket on hold. But they only hold it 24 hours. You got to pay. Didn't have the money for it. So I was sitting at my computer and my wife said, you know that ticket's on hold. You got to pay for that by tomorrow or we're going to lose it. I said, I know. And so I was sitting there thinking, what am I going to do? What am I going to do? So I reached over and picked up my phone. And I thought, I'll call some pastor friends that have been good to me. And maybe I can raise this up and they'll give me the money. Because pastors have been very generous and very kind, helping with our overseas trips. I picked up my phone and the Lord said, put it down. Trust me. I said, all right. Just one call, Lord. He said, trust me. I said, uh, I trust you to talk to some folks. He said, trust me. <laughs> picking it up and putting it down. Picking it up and putting it down. I let it go. I forgot about it. Laying in bed with my wife that night, about the midnight hour. My phone's over on the side. What do they call that table beside the bed? The end table. Over on the end table beside the bed. We're talking and I hear it dinging over there. Ah, Somebody's sending me a message. What in the world do they want? I reach over like this, find my phone, pull it around to my face. It's a text from a man. He said, I saw you're getting ready to make an overseas trip. How much do you need? I text back, thank you very much for texting. So happy to talk to you. $5,500. <laughs> His next text said, Felt like the Lord spoke to me to take care of this one. Check will be in the mail tomorrow. This man is not even in our fellowship. He's not even, it w there's no possible way I would have called him on that phone. No way. He's not even in the United Pentecostal Church. This man had no way of knowing that I was trusting the Lord. The Lord said, trust me, I got this one. And that man sent the check the next day and took care of that entire trip. I don't know what God's been working on, but he's about to pull his hand back and he's going to say, let me show you what I've been doing. Pastor Blankenship, I'm telling you, Pastor, God's been working on some stuff. God's got some things already in the making. You're going to make a call or you're going to happen into somebody in a restaurant or you're going to be talking to somebody and you're going to make connection with it and you didn't even know it was out there and you're going to come back to this church and you're going to tell them listen this is what's going on this is what I just discovered looks like this could be a God thing I'm telling you there's some God things in the making for this church I am prophesying to you tonight that God is setting things in divine order he's making a way where there is no way he's making a way out of nothing would you stand with me across this house tonight Oh, I need to finish. I need to finish. I've, I've, have I told you all the passport story? I, I got to tell you this real quick. You, you're standing. You'll be all right. Play a little soft music. Make everybody comfortable. <laughs> this is my 
third and final close. <laughs> you'll, you'll appreciate this little extra overtime right here. Many years ago in Ethiopia, we were on the bus leaving Addis Ababa going down to Awara. And just outside of town, Brother and Sister Marcelli got my attention. She had her pocketbook strode out all over the seat. She said, Brother Kleinitz, we've lost our passport and tickets. We don't know where they are. Maybe we left them at the hotel. I went up and told Brother Cole, he said, pull the bus over. He said, this is very serious. We need a miracle. <laughs> That's the way he talked. We need a miracle. We got to praying. We prayed and prayed and prayed and prayed. After a few minutes, Brother, Brother Cole said, Brother Kleindienst, tell Sister Marcelli to look in her pocketbook again inside the zipper. I went back there and said, he said, look in the pocketbook again. All the stuff's already out. It's all, all over the seat, you know. She said, I said, just do it. I had watched her going through. I watched her when she reached in that pocketbook. And her hand went down in there. And her eyes got big as golf balls. And she pulled that passport and tickets right out in just one reach like that. I said, Brother Cole, she found him. It's a miracle. Let's go. Years later, I'm over in Malaysia. I have a couple of people with me. Brother Sklusa Czech, children's minister. Comes to me and says, Brother Klein, I got a problem. I've lost my passport. He said, I always keep it in the back pocket of my jeans. He said, I went to the bed, picked them up, reached in that pocket. They're not there. He said, I've been through every pair of pants I have. I've looked everywhere. It's just not there anywhere. I said, we're going to pray. We prayed. I said, now go to your room and look in that pocket of those jeans. He went and looked, came back down, knocked on the door. He said, wasn't there. <laughs> I said, well, uh, okay. Uh, yeah, I didn't expect it either. <laughs> it was not the way I was trained. He's supposed to have had a miracle right there. We'll get back to you. I said, well, you're going to have to go to the embassy. I always make the people travel with me, take copies of their passports and everything so they, if something like this would happen. He said, take your copy, go to the embassy, and get a passport. He left. I'm in Malaysia. I'm in a dirty, dark, dingy hotel room. It's not good for a man to be alone. And I'm spiraling down into the depths of sorrow and despair. Sitting there on that sofa, some great apostle I am. I try to get a passport, get Brother Cole praise. Passport miraculously appears in the pocketbook. My guy's over at the embassy. I decide on the spot that I am out of the will of God. Shouldn't be going anywhere overseas. Supposed to be an apostle. Not sure I'm even called to be a preacher. What am I doing out here? This is it. And then, you got to understand me and God, I do a lot of stupid stuff I should not do. But I got a little uptight. And I said, God, this is it. If that man don't get that passport, not the one at the embassy, I'm through. If I can't get a miracle, I don't belong over here. This is my last trip. Bam, I slammed my hand down on that sofa and dust come up out of it and bugs and I'm coughing and choking and hacking. It. I'm telling you, there's nothing glorious about this moment at all. I got over in the bed, pulled the covers over my head and I'm thinking, I'm just going home and I'm done with all this. Pretty soon there's a knock at the door. There's my guy. Brother Klein I got the new passport. That's just great. He said, but something else. I said, what? He reached in his back and he said, I got to the room. And he said, I was getting ready to put them jeans in the, in the suitcase. He said, when I picked them up, out of the back pocket, fell my passport. He's standing there with two of them. I said, well, well, well. I said, I know that don't mean anything to you, but thank you very much. God bless you. Have a nice day. Slam. I am the apostle born out of new season, devil. Don't you mess with me. 
I'm back on top of things around here. Do you see that right there? Uh-huh. Didn't know who he was messing with. I mean, it's a little late, and the passport wasn't any good anymore, but nevertheless, I'm a junior apostle. I'm still working at it. Some of you minor prophets don't get too upset. You'll be a major prophet one of these days. But, you know, sometimes we're a little late, but we get there. Just, you know, we're working on it. <laughs> I'm in this position now, like Brother Tenney said one time, once you've swallowed the cat, don't choke on the tail. There's, there's one last installment to the passport story. I was back in Malaysia a number of years later with Nick Mahaney. I don't know, y'all don't know Nick. You need to get Nick Mahaney to come preach here. Needs to be done. I'm giving an apostolic command. I'm issuing a divine order. Must be done and y'all got to pay for it. And I take Nick with me. Now you got to understand me and Nick. We are best of friends, but we are polar opposites. When I go into a hotel room, everything comes out of the suitcase. Everything's lined up nice and neat. All the clothes are hung just a little bit apart. Everything's in perfect order. Nick walks in, dumps his stuff out on the bed. When he gets done, he just scoops it all up, smashes it in, and goes home. Mine all goes, everything in my suitcase is in a bag, and then that bag's in a bag, and I put it all back in those bags before I take it home because I'm OCD and I'm a little insane. And so we're over there, and for 25, 30 years, I've been putting my passport in my backpack on the front pocket down in the same place. And we preached Tuesday night, and we were catching the midnight flight back home, the red eye. He had checked out of his room, come down to my room. We had showered, ready to go, got everything ready, and I reached in there to get my passport, and it's not there. And I'm like, no way. We tear that room apart. We're crawling around on the floor. We've got, this, we've got the uh, mattress thrown off the bed. We've got the cushions out of the sofa. We've got the curtains off the hooks crawling around. I got a little flashlight. I'm looking everywhere. I got my suitcase out. I've been through every pocket, everything, everywhere. It's nowhere to be found. I make Nick underdo his suitcase, look through all of his stuff. There's no way in God's green earth I'd have gave him my passport. Just, there's no way. He looks through everything. He don't have it. It's getting late. I said, Nick, you're going to have to go because I'm stuck here. So he left and went to the airport. My suitcase is packed. Curtains are down on the sofa. I'm dressed. I'm so discouraged. I just get in the bed, dressed, pull the covers up. And I'm laying there in the dark. God, it's December. I'm going to miss Christmas. That's your birthday, remember? I'm not over here on vacation, God. I'm trying to do your work. I could use a little help in case you hadn't been paying attention. It's so dark, I can't see nothing. I've got my hand up in the atmosphere. And I'm saying to God, it's just a passport. Put it in my hand. I won't tell nobody where I got it. Just let it just appear. How hard can this be? I'm reminding him you part of the Red Sea. You caught up Elijah in a cloud. You know, Daniel came out of the lion's den. Manna from heaven. Passport! <laughs> Nothing. I'm laying there. Got to go to the embassy. Going to have to get a passport. I'm going to cost me $5,000 to get home. This is the worst day of my life. What am I doing this for? I should have never been a preacher. I'm probably not even called. <laughs> phone rings. It's Nick on the phone. Hey, everything working out all right? Get over here right away. I said, what are you talking about? He said, bro, I stand in line. I got up, get my passport and take it to the lady. Lady handed the passport back and said, that ain't you. I said, what? He said, I've got your passport, man. Hurry up. How'd you? I don't know, but I got it. So I got 30 minutes to get to the airport. And it's a 45-minute drive. I'm dressed. Suitcase packed. So within 20 seconds, I'm out the door, down the elevator. I'm running across that big foyer. I see the concierge guy. I said, I need a taxi. He says, let's go out here and call one. As we're opening up, going outside, the big doors open up. There sits a taxi. Man laid up against the window. I've been in and out of that door all week. There's never been a taxi there. 
I, I said, I got to get to the airport. I jump in the back. I don't know. He's talking his language. I'm talking mine. We don't either want to understand what we're saying. But on that airport, 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 he's, I got to go. He is driving like a wild man. He's driving, he's passing cars on the right. We're going over in the dirt. We're in the grass. We're back on the road. We're over on the left hand side. We got to go through three toll booths. He never stops. He flies through, throws money out the window. Don't know if it hit the thing or not. We keep moving. He's flying. We come screeching into the airport. I'm about 10 minutes late. I get my stuff out. I go running into the airport. My desk is the very first one, but the lights are out. I'm standing there and went, oh, no. Little lady popped her head up. She said, are you the guy? I said, I'm the guy. She said, since I had your passport, I went ahead and printed out your boarding passes. You have to hurry. So I go get it. She says, go over there. Go down the escalator. I go down the escalator. I'm running to go through the little security thing, the belt. As I get over there, about 25 people run and get in front of me. I don't know where they came from. Hell. And they come get in front of me. And I'm standing back here doing like this. The guy all the way up at the front, he leans out and goes like this. And goes, I said. I look over there, there's another belt. But it's off, it's dark, there's nobody there. I look, I go, he said. I said. I take off over there. On my way over there, some guy just appears out of nowhere. Walks over, turns the belt on, turns the light on. I'm through. I'm running, trying to read foreign language. I got to get on a train. I got to go down a long hallway. I got to round corners. I go running. I'm the very last person. I finally get through. That I'm the last one on the airplane. I go rushing in. I flop down in my seat. And Nick says, I knew you'd make it. (laughs) Shut up. Here's the point. Here's the point. If I had found the passport in the room, it wouldn't have worked. She printed out the boarding pass before she closed down the computer because she had the passport. If I hadn't have been dressed, it wouldn't have worked. If my suitcase wasn't already packed, it wouldn't have worked. If the taxi driver hadn't have been sitting outside the door, it wouldn't have worked. If he hadn't have been willing to drive like a crazy person, it wouldn't have worked. If the lady hadn't have been thoughtful enough to print it out, it wouldn't have worked. If the man hadn't pushed me in security on the other line, it wouldn't have worked. But the steps. Of a good man are ordered by the Lord. Woo! Who am I prophesying to tonight? God's getting ready to open a door and make a way. I need somebody to step out of where you're sitting and start walking down to this altar and say, I don't know what I'm getting ready to walk into. I don't know what I'm about to bump into. I don't know what's about to happen. I can't see it. I can't feel it. I don't know it. I don't understand it. I don't even know where it is or where it's coming from. Woo! One phone call. One connection. 24 hours can change everything. The judges say an order in the court. Order in your life. I declare prophetically over you divine order. I declare divine providence in your finances. Oh, I prophesy there's going to be testimonies coming out of this service. There's going to be testimonies that that night things started changing. Order my steps in your way, oh Lord. Come on, somebody touch the hem of his garment. Everybody didn't make it to Sunday night, but you did. You made it to hear this.
the memory. God's got you. My brother, God's got it. It's beyond you. It's beyond me, but it's not beyond God. You don't have the intellect for it. You don't have the emotion for it. You don't have the training for it. But you've got the God for it. You've got the God for it. The God that can make it happen. Woo! Look what he's already done. Imagine what he's getting ready to do. He's ordering. Jesus. Jesus, take the wheel. Greater than his greatest faith. 
in the name of Jesus. Who knows where you could be a year from now or two years from now.
Let's just move into intercession. You don't have to worry about the words to say. Just let the Holy Ghost speak through you. Just intercede on somebody's behalf. You may not even know who it is, but the Lord knows what He's doing through you and through the burden that you feel. something with you very quickly and then I'll step out of the way let Brother Bembry close with his thoughts from the Lord I feel like the Lord wants me to say this publicly and I don't know when I'll be in the proper context and it just happened last week so it's kind of fresh in my spirit and uh, so it seemed like this is the right place right time for me to just got to go on record and, and say something uh, publicly so I'll give you sort of the very surface broad stroke of our housing situation that's quite a serious situation for our family and uh, trying to get into something at my age and with the kind of income that I have makes it very difficult bank loans and things of that nature we did get approved for a mortgage but under a very strenuous type situation with a large down payment and those things so we're working on it. We're, we're doing what we can, the way we can. But on the phone with an elder minister, back, I say last week, it was actually in between Sunday and here, just this past week, um, I was sort of explaining to him the situation, asking him to pray. And he said, didn't God give you a vehicle a couple years ago? I said, oh, you have a Lexus. He said, don't you think God can give you a house the same way he gave you a Lexus? I said, well, I suppose he can. And then this is the part I want to speak to you tonight to maybe help you. I said it to him. As of standing here before you tonight, I received the prophetic declaration. But there is zero evidence, zero system steps there is not one single thing in my mind that I could wrap my brain around how that could happen, where, when, through who. I don't know anybody with an extra house. I don't know anybody just giving them away. There is absolutely not a shred of any kind of reasonable expectation or evidence that anything of that nature or close to it could anyway be in the works or happening. So I'm just saying I believe. One of these days I'll tell you how the story ends. <laughs> but I just wanted to go on record tonight with no evidence, with no reasonable, logical, normal expectation of something just falling out of the sky. As much as a man of faith I am, I'm also strapped with a very analytical, logical thinking mind. And I just can't wrap my brain around the mechanics of how such a thing could even progress to become a reality. So it's beyond me. It's out of my reach. 
It's beyond my understanding. I can't see it. I don't feel it. I don't understand it. I don't know it. But I want to go on record. I believe it. Put your hand this way and let's pray for the kindness, for brother and sister kindness right now. Father, in the name of Jesus, as he has honored your house, honor his, Lord. Lord, as he has blessed your name, ask you to bless him, Lord. In the name of Jesus, you are the way maker and you will make a way, Lord. God, this week the word comes, this week that it's settled, this week direction comes because you order his steps. And it's pleasing to you in the name of the Lord. Praise God. Praise God. The scripture he read tonight that he opened up with, that the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. And he delighteth in his way. Another version says it this way. The Lord directs the steps of of the godly. You know, sometimes we think it's, well, it's that person or it's that person. No, it's us. It's us. The Lord directs the steps of the godly, and He delights in every detail of their lives. Sometimes we can be going through stuff and we think, how can this get God glory? But it does, because God, when things are Seems like there, there's no way it's going to happen. God can turn it around because that's what He does. It's what He specializes in. He specializes in making a way where there is no way. He specializes bringing light into darkness. Amen. I want us to pray tonight. Many of you noticed Sister Cook left. Uh, Pastor Clay took Sister Clay to the hospital. She was wanting to be here for service, was wanting to make it through service. We're going to pray for her at the end of service. We're still going to do that. I just wanted to let you know that she is uh, not doing well as she was here. She has a, because of infection in her body, she has a fever that cannot be nixed. It, it, it just, she keeps having it. So she's going to, the, she's at the hospital now. And uh, we'll probably have to go on to D.C. this week. But you know, God has done some amazing things in her life. She's one of only five or six that had a surgery that was a breakthrough surgery of trying to replace their digestive system, their her intestines and so forth, and she's been back and forth to the doctor. She, they were given five years. All the other patients died before the five years. I think she's on year, somebody, if you know the year, tell me, but I think she's on year seven or eight, eight. She's on year eight. And I do not believe her end is yet. Would you lift her voice up with me right now? Father, we come before you. You're the God of mercy and the God of grace. God, the things that you're doing in Tracy Cook's life, we don't understand. But God, there's been a testimony. There's been people she's prayed through to the Holy Ghost while she's laying in a bed. But God, use this woman for your glory. I don't believe it's time yet for her to go. But, Lord, we trust in you. We trust in you, Lord. Use her, Lord. Use it for your glory, God. Oh. Brother Stanley's in the hospital, but he's getting out tomorrow morning. <laughs> Brother Myers is our hospital chaplain, and he told me last night, he says, I was there last week, and he must have had eight different things hooked up to him. He said, I went to see him tonight, and that was last night, and uh, he said, there's nothing hooked up to him. <laughs> so God has just turned it around in a week. Praise God. But he's, he's able to talk. You know, he had this, this cancer in his throat, around his vocal cords, but yet he can talk normal. His vocal cords are fine. I'm telling you, that's the kind of God we serve. Yeah. 
Now I want us to pray for Sister Weaver. She is, uh, she's broken her ankle. She goes to surgery. It's either Tuesday or Thursday of this week. But uh, I want us to pray for her as well. Can we lift her up right now? Father, you know the need in her body. And we know that you can heal her before she even goes to the doctor. But God, if you direct her steps to go that route, we're trusting you, Lord. We trust in you that you will use this for your glory, God. God, do the work in her family. Do the work in her body. Heal her, Lord. And God, we give you glory for what you're doing in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Would you clap your hands unto the Lord? I'm looking for Sister Cheyenne. Where are you? Oh, there we go. You were right there a minute ago. I like I like our... She's... Uh, yesterday, her family had uh, a party for her for for graduation, for her birthday, and for going to college. So I came in, gave her a little hug. I said, "Happy bir- congratulations, happy birthday, and goodbye. But uh, she's going to be a part of the church. She's going to Rad U, Radford University, on a full-paid scholarship. <laughs> the Lord's directing her steps. She's going to be the beginning of a campus ministry there. We thank God for that. Amen. Like Brother Jarvis to come. He's our campus ministry director for the district, so you'll be seeing him some more. But uh, I want some of our college and career, some that have been to college and know what it's like to go through this, would you come? And we're going to pray for her. We're going to pray for her. She's leaving this week. This is her last Sunday service. She might or might not be with us Wednesday, but this is her last Sunday service. Amen. That's it. Just gather in. Let's pray for her. So Cheyenne, we love you. We're so glad you could be a part of us. And this is still home. I just want to remind you. <laughs> so when you have a break, you come on home. Praise God. I heard there some of her family, different ones, say yesterday, but you're still in Virginia, so look out. So you might show up and see her, but look at this, love. Look at this. Let's pray. Father, we thank you. Thank you for what you're doing in her life, God, directing her steps, God, using her. Jesus. Oh God, guide her steps. Guide her words, Lord. Lord, speak words of encouragement and uplifting God to others. Use her as a light, God, as she walks onto that campus. Oh God, that others would see, Lord, because you said we are salt and we are light to this world, Lord. Use her for your glory, God. God, keep her, protect her, watch over her, Lord. And Lord, help her in her studies. We give you glory, God, the dreams that you've given her, Lord. Lord, let them come to pass in the name of Jesus. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Praise God. Praise God. It's been a wonderful week, a wonderful weekend. It's been so good having Brother Kleindens with us last week and this week. If you missed any of it. Please go back. Just go to YouTube. You can just say Doug Kleinist or say Norfolk Apostolic Church, but pull it up. We have our videos there. And uh, it's great being part of this family. We love every one of you. Amen. We're here for you. Anytime you need us, we're here for you. We love you. Amen. Greet one another. Amen. I'm going to let Brother James run it, Brother Joey. They love to play, love to minister. If they want to play on, you want to stay, that's fine. But if you need to go, you can. You want to fellowship, you can. Amen. God bless you. We love you. We'll see you Wednesday night.